I'd now like to uh, welcome to the stage our final speaker for the uh, presentation part of this, um, who will be familiar to uh, any of you who've been to the previous uh, uh, London Futurist events. Aubrey de Grey, uh, who's the Chief Science Officer and co-founder of the uh, SEDS Foundation, talking about whether or not the the days of ageing are clearly numbered. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, she is going to do it. Aubrey? Oh, yeah, talk to me. All right, thanks, Dean. Um, and thanks for David for letting me along. Um, yeah, so. Um, it's always fun being the last speaker of the day, um, especially after such a fantastic series of other talks. Um, and since, as Dean mentioned, I, I think most of you are probably familiar with the basics of what I do and what I've been doing in the past 15 years or so. Is it not working? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think the mic, your, your beard is interfering in the microphone. What? Your beard is interfering. Oh, Oh, sorry, is that bad? <laughs> I'll put it down a bit, see whether that's working. I'll just speak louder. <laughs> All right, is this working? More or less. All right. All right. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about something that's rather narrowly focused on the theme of the meeting. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I think we uh, need to anticipate the situation a decade or more from now, um, uh, and especially how I think in the context of technology that may seriously bring ageing under medical control, we have reason for substantial concern with regard not only to the near-term level of funding, the sort of thing that Ruby just spoke about, um, that may be slowing down the rate at which these technologies are developed, but also um, thereafter concerns about the issues of dissemination, of uh, enthusiasm for this technology as it approaches fruition. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about for a while, and if anything, I'm getting a little bit more concerned as time goes on. Um, so this is the, you know, the one slide summary of what I've been doing for the past 15 years. Um, some time ago now, I, I realized that it was going to be easier to attack the problem of ageing by this thing called the maintenance approach than by other approaches. At the moment, pretty much everything that we try to do in the clinic against the diseases and disabilities of old age uh, comes under the heading of the geriatrics approach, treating those diseases and disabilities very much as if they were infections that could be eliminated from the body. Um, and it's been understood by some people for a very long time that this makes no sense for those diseases and disabilities because they are ultimately side effects of being alive in the first place. Um, they are um, the consequences, the late, um, um, the, the eventual consequences of the lifelong accumulation of the damage that the body does to itself as a side effect of its normal operation. But unfortunately, the um, traditional uh, way of thinking about avoiding the, uh, the pitfall of the geriatric approach has been to try to find ways to manipulate our metabolism so that the damage that metabolism does to itself is uh, incurred more slowly than it normally would be, and this turns out to be just as difficult, uh, if not harder, than the geriatric approach, uh, essentially because metabolism is so complicated. So the maintenance approach says basically rather than trying to slow down either of those two steps, instead let's disconnect them from each other. Let's somehow uncouple them by periodically going in and repairing that damage before it becomes abundant enough to make us sick. Um, and it seems to be a pretty promising approach. Obviously, I broke it down into a whole bunch of different sub-problems, and we are working on all of those at Science Research Foundation, uh, and other people are increasingly beginning to realize that this is a reasonably promising approach, uh, but of course there's a long way to go. Many of the technologies that come under this rubric are still at a pretty early stage, and I would say that the rate at which this research is proceeding
proceeding at the moment could be troubled if we had unlimited funding assigned to this. At the moment, just one of the seven major themes that I normally discuss could be regarded as well-funded, that is stem cell research, and we don't do much of that because other people are doing it. Uh, but pretty much all the others are still criminally neglected, and the budget that we have, which is in the region of four to five million dollars, is probably... Um, as much as the, uh, the, the U.S. government is spending on what I regard as the most relevant technologies in those areas. So it's a pitifully underfunded space. However, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the longer term. So the core goal that we have, of course, is to, um, to get these technologies to work. And the... Um, uh, the, the, the consequence of doing so, in my view, would be what I write here. I've used this term, robust human rejuvenation, to describe it. I claim that what it's going to be able to do is to add roughly 30 years of healthy life to the lives of people who are already in middle age, 60 or possibly older, when the therapies are first administered. And since it's being done by repairing damage, what that basically means is that these people will be rejuvenated somewhat, quite a lot actually, such that they won't be biologically 60 again until they are chronologically 90. That's the core goal of what we do. And, you know, it's a pretty ambitious goal, but we think we've got a respectable chance of doing it within the next 20 or 25 years, subject to funding. One of the previous speakers pointed out how... Um, how uh, dangerous it is to make predictions about the future in terms of pioneering technologies, and I completely agree with that. I think it's always important, and I always try to point out that even though we may have a 50% chance of getting to this point within uh, 25 years or so, uh, we've got at least a 10% chance of not getting there within 100 years, um, because we may hit obstacles that we're not yet aware of. Of course, the other thing that I always like to make sure people appreciate is that th it doesn't really matter that it's speculative in that regard, because 50% is quite enough of a good chance to be worth aiming for. Uh, but still, that's the goal. So then the question is, um, what comes before that, and also what comes after that? So what comes before it is robust mass rejuvenation, proof of concept in the lab. <laughs> And, um, and I've defined that uh, many years ago now. I also uh, gave a somewhat arbitrary but nevertheless um, new, uh, s a specific definition to that term. I say what it means is, first of all, we take a bunch of mice that are otherwise perfectly happy for mice. In other words, they live maybe three years. That's on the long side of the, uh, of the spectrum for mice. Um, and we do, don't do anything at all to them until they're already in middle age, just like in the human case. We wait until they're two years old, and we add two years of healthy life to what they've got. So in other words, we basically treble their remaining lifespan so that they die around their fifth birthday. Now, the idea here is, first of all, obviously, we'll learn a whole bunch of science about how we'll, we'll make actual steps towards developing robust human rejuvenation, but also we will have an impact on public opinion. It seems, it's always seemed to me that this is the sort of um, amount of progress that would leave no real chance, no real risk of, um, of people being able to preserve their scepticism, their caution with regard to the feasibility of the core goal, robust human rejuvenation. Of course, we still won't know how long it's going to take to get to the human goal, but it will be basically impossible to deny that it's only a matter of time. Whereas today, one is still in the position of being able to, if not make a case, at least have an intuition that it might just never be possible. You know, that AD might just be too hard to fix. So this is um, the, the, a, a large part of the reason why I've always been interested in this. Now, of course, there's also the longer term beyond robust human rejuvenation, and futurist audiences tend to focus on this a lot, um, on the concept that I introduced many years ago now called longevity escape velocity. 
it essentially says that because these therapies we're talking about are rejuvenation therapies, therapies that actually fix people up so that they're biologically younger than they were before the therapies occurred, as opposed to just slowing down the accumulation of damage, that means that we buy time very effectively. And in particular, we are highly likely to buy enough time with that initial round of therapies that give 30 years of extra life to allow us to improve the therapies in time for the same people. In other words, those people I was mentioning earlier who will not be chronologically, will not be biologically 60 for the second time until they're chronologically 90, can be re-rejuvenated so that they won't be biologically 60 for a third time until they're, let's say, chronologically 150, and so on. And the idea, of course, is that we would stay one step ahead of the problem uh, indefinitely, and that the impact on how long people would stay youthful would be identical to the situation if these therapies had been 100% comprehensive in repairing damage right from the beginning. Simple idea, I always thought, you know, really easy for people in this, in this room to understand. Turns out that it's not so easy for the rest of the world to understand. I have been astonished, absolutely stupefied at the intensity of resistance to this, to me, completely bleeding obvious concept. Um, you know, people will say it's not scientific, it, by which they mean I'm not saying how it's going to be done in the same way I am saying how the first goal of adding 30 years is going to be done. Um, and they seem perfectly happy to infer from the fact that we don't know how it's going to be done the conclusion that it isn't going to be done, uh, which is about as crazy as you can get, really. Uh, and, you know, people just seem to, like, seem to prefer to think about more modest goals. Um, uh, of course, when it comes to entertainment value, when we're talking to journalists, the, the opposite is the case. So I spend my entire time trying to stop people using the word immortality to describe my work. Um, um, uh, but, but when it comes to sober reflection and actual assessment of the probability that we might get these things to happen, the idea of actually um, you know, taking this argument seriously seems to be very un unattractive indeed. So that's always been an enormous shock to me. It's pretty much the only real shock I've had. Uh, all of the other resistance that I've had, whether to the feasibility of, of medically defeating aging or, for that matter, the desirability, has been pretty much what I would have expected when I was starting out in this field. But this one really took me back surprise. So, the big question I have that I want to focus on today is whether we might be in for a similar kind of surprise in the next several years with regard to the other end of the sequence of events I've been talking about. Might it be the case that when we develop these mice that are able to live two years longer than they otherwise would as a result of therapies applied to them in middle age, that they will not actually deliver a, uh, a, a, a sea change in public opinion. Now, the first thing is that if they didn't, that would actually, in my mind, be a good deal more justified than the surprise I talked about on the previous slide. In other words, I don't think it's nearly so certain that success in mice at the level I'm talking about here will guarantee reasonably near-term success in humans, as it is that success in humans will guarantee longevity escape velocity. Um, so, you know, in a sense, I'm more hesitant here. But um, you know, we need to think about this. In the best case, of course, the best, the, the, the best case scenario is that actually we wouldn't need to get as far as robust mass rejuvenation. That what I'm calling sub-RMR, in other words, a less dramatic amount of progress in the lab would suffice to uh, cause a kind of tipping point in public opinion, a general acceptance that this is going to happen and that it's a good thing and all, and, and all that. But the worst case scenario is that, it's, it, it, that even that amount of progress isn't enough. And of course the key thing I want to come back to is that people's perception of the feasibility of this goal is the number one determinant of people's interest in trying to hasten it by supporting it financially or indirectly, you know, voting for you know, government policies that finances or whatever. 
That's really important, because as I mentioned a moment ago, we're probably going three times more slowly than we could be if we had unlimited funding. And that's, you know, that's a hell of a lot of years that might be lost, and therefore a hell of a lot of lives that might be lost if we don't fix this problem really quickly. Back in, I'm going to say 2004 was the time that I started giving an actual estimate of time frames for how long this was going to take, and I said that I thought it was going to be about 10 years before we got to robust mass rejuvenation, subject to funding. And lo and behold, the amount of progress we've actually made, I would say, is about three years. We're probably still six to eight years away. So, you know, it's not good. It's not good at all. Now, I don't think it's quite as bad as those raw numbers imply. I think there's a fair chance that we'll catch up eventually, once the tipping point does occur, that there will be progress that benefits from the intervening serendipity that's occurred. But still, I think that for for every year that we lose now, we're probably losing you know, three to six months in the long run. So that's still a hell of a lot of lives. We've got to find a way to anticipate 2025 to actually figure out how to ensure that robust mass rejuvenation is the worst case scenario. In other words, that there's no, uh, to minimize and render negligible the chance that resistance to the feasibility of medically defeating aging will persist beyond the achievement of that kind of goal. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, first thing I want to talk about is why it matters in the lab today. At the moment, there's certainly plenty of um, plenty of straightforward scientific justification for simply working on mice as a route towards figuring out what's going to work on humans, just as there is for drug development across the whole, the whole of biomedical research. But if we're right that getting mice to live a hell of a lot longer in a good state of health will have a really decisive impact on public opinion, then it follows that we should probably prioritize work on mice even over and above what the science recommends. You should, you know, we should even do things that might not end up, that we think might not end up being particularly relevant to being stepping stones to human therapies if they're going to make a big difference to the date at which we achieve robust mass rejuvenation. So that's an important thing to be able to quantify. If we think that we need to aim for a different goal, either a less dramatic one or a more dramatic one, in order to actually cause public opinion to change, then that will actually alter, in some ways at least, exactly which experiments we do today. Second thing we need to do in terms of anticipating um, 2025 is we have to remember that changing public opinion doesn't always happen overnight. You know, some things are really easy to say once the, um, once the idea starts getting out there, simply because they really work. You know, smartphones, the internet, whatever. But some things take a hell of a long time to actually get accepted and, and, and understood, um, especially if there's a lot of regulatory um, machinery between uh, the, between A and B, so to speak. Uh, so, so we need to bear that in mind. We need to understand that even if we start this tipping point, it may not be a particularly sudden sea change, and therefore the sooner we start, the sooner we'll finish. So I'm going to um, spend the rest of my time, in the last five minutes or so, on three major aspects of what I've just said. And I'm not... Uh, just like Ruva, I'm not really going to try to provide any answers. I'm just really trying to start a conversation, and in that sense, I guess it's probably a good thing that, um, that immediately after this we're going to have half an hour or more of, uh, of discussion, because uh, I don't by any means have good answers to most of these points. I'm going to talk about the ways in which this problem differs across the world. I'm going to talk about the enormous problem that this whole endeavor has around people's perception of risk-benefit ratios, and I'm also going to say a few words about economics. So first of all, culture. Now, I do a lot of public speaking and a lot of media. I do probably 50 talks a year, and I do probably 100 interviews a year. It's 
fucking painful. I hate it, really. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but the fact is, it's part of the job. It's something we've got, we've got to do to just raise the quality of debate and get the word out. And, um, you know, I don't resent it all that much, really. Uh, um, but the key thing is, where I do these things, I spend, I, I probably give, if I'm lucky, one or two lectures in anywhere east of Israel. Okay, and the proportion of interviews I do is not much better. It's ridiculously low. Now, ostensibly, you might think this is really weird that the um, you know, the, the interest in this is so heavily restricted to the Western world. Because, after all, it, many Eastern cultures have this really rather strong reputation for having much greater respect for the elderly than what we tend to see in the West. I figure that it's basically it's the wrong sort of respect. That ultimately, the type of respect that you have there is the type that I occasionally see in the West, especially expounded by people who like to call themselves social gerontologists. And this, it's basically that um, you want to make sure that the elderly preserve their dignity. You want to actually make them feel good about themselves and not make them feel that they're in any way inferior. And it is generally perceived, or at least this is my impression, that treating, uh, uh, portraying aging as a medical problem, which I'm going yeah, medicalizing is the word I'm using here, is counterproductive to that. It actually somehow undermines the dignity of the elderly. Now, I think that's just about as wrong-headed as one can be. You know, I think it's about as ageist as one can be not to regard the ill health of the elderly as the world's most important problem. But that's nevertheless how things are. It seems to be even harder to get people from Eastern cultures, and I mean really very generally here, I'm not just talking about any particular country, um, to get people from Eastern cultures to appreciate that aging is a medical problem than it is to get people in the West to do that. So we really need to fix that. After all, we can all uh, point to very obvious characteristics of, of, of numerous Eastern cultures that greatly recommend them as spearheads of this kind of mission. The fact that you know, they, you know, they have uh, perhaps a stronger work ethic in some cases, and they, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a great deal of money in places like China and Japan, and you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, appreciation of how to do actual technology development that is perhaps in many cases more um, efficient and streamlined and effective than corresponding things in the West. So if they only wanted to do this, they could be enormously major players. And I have no idea how to change that. I've been trying for some time, and of course we do have isolated supporters in, uh, in those parts of the world, but it doesn't seem to be growing very fast, and I really think that there's a high priority to fix that. Risk. The thing about this is that the medicines that we're talking about here are functionally preventative medicines. Transla uh, uh, treating aging means treating the damage that accumulates throughout life and only causes us to get sick late in life. So that means that fundamentally it's preventative medicine for the diseases and disabilities of old age. And preventative medicine is a nice sounding term, and people generally say that they're in favor of it, but when the rubber hits the road, it's an incredibly hard sell, for the very obvious reason that people don't like the idea of submitting themselves to medical interventions, especially experimental medical interventions that are new, when they're not yet sick. Simple as that. So we need to fix this. Of course, the obvious way to fix it is simply to make people convinced that the preventative medicine is so safe that the risk just is as small as the perceived reward. And, of course, that's why natural products are relatively easy to sell as preventative medicines. But unfortunately, natural products don't really work very well against aging, as we all know. If we look at other examples in, you know, in pharma, there are very, very few cases of preventative medicines that have become really big. And really the only glimmer of hope here is to look at the example of statins, which is of course one big exception, and to observe how we might be able to follow the same path. 
Statins actually were not originally sold as preventatives for atherosclerosis, for cardiovascular disease. They were originally sold as treatments, and they kind of migrated gradually towards the, um, towards the more preventative side of things. Now, a good thing about the idea of treating the precursors of age-related ill health is that not only will those things be able to prevent the ill health from emerging in the first place, but also if those things are applied, are co-administered to people who are already in a state of relatively advanced age-related disease, co-administered with traditional treatments that come under my classification of the geriatrics approach, then they will potentiate those therapies. In other words, they will essentially solve the inherent um, shortcoming of the geriatrics approach, which is that therapies get increasingly less effective as the precursors, the original accumulating damage, becomes more abundant. If the damage can be addressed and also the pathologies can be addressed, then you've got an actual working model for treating people who are already sick. So I think that that's kind of going to be how these things are rolled out, but I think that it may be necessary to start making that case, talking specifically about about diseases and about how these therapies can synergize with existing therapies, even right now at this early, early stage when these therapies are still a long way away from even existing. It's something that I've begun to do a little bit in my talks. If some of you have seen, me, seen my talks over the past, let's say, six months or so, you'll notice that there's a lot more emphasis on the relationship between damage and pathology than there used to be. And I'm wondering whether we ought to do more of this. A lot of why I'm talking about this sort of thing today, incidentally, is because even though I'm extremely energetic in terms of how much I try to get the word out, you know, I'm only one person, I have one particular way of saying things, and one thing I always mention to people when they ask me how I can help is, unless they're already billionaires or biologists, I always say the main thing to do is to find ways to get the word out and to be an advocate, and every advocate is different. Every advocate has their own way of saying things, their own voice, and so long as they give sensible, good answers, the way they give those answers can definitely be an enhancement to the effectiveness of this movement. The other thing that's really difficult with risk is the fact that Aging is so complicated and multifactorial, and that as, as a result, the damage repair approach to addressing aging is itself multifactorial. It's a divide and conquer approach. That means that we need to have combinatorial therapies. And doctors, in general, the medical profession don't like that. They like to keep things simple in order to understand when things are going wrong. We've got to change that mindset as well. Doctors are hard people to change the attitudes of, just as you know, people who've spent their entire careers in any profession now. We heard about that today as well. Finally, economics. So, um, how do how do tipping points in enthusiasm for new technologies ever happen, or at least how do they ever happen rapidly? The fundamental answer is that you need that, that the people who are the leaders, you know, the visionaries who actually develop the technologies, who think of them and get them going, they need to actually make them perceived as successful. They need to make everyone else envious, not just of the money they're making, but of, you know, and so, uh, uh, they need to, they, well, they do need to make people envious of the money they're making so that other people get involved, so that people who are thinking more traditionally switch gears. And uh, that needs, of course, you, you, you want to make money by selling stuff, basically, and that means you've got to have, have a customer base. You need a critical mass of early adopters. The transhumanist community, the futurist community in general, is simply not big enough yet to, consist, to, to constitute a critical mass from a commercial perspective. So we need to grow this community in all manner of ways in order to make that happen. And I don't really know how to do that. Of course, you know, it's grown over the years that we've been involved in this, but we need to make that happen soon. And in particular, we need to make it happen in time. When I say in time, what I mean is simply before we get robust mass rejuvenation. The sooner we get 
robust mass rejuvenation, the better. But if the public is still not ready to acknowledge that that means we are, get, we are within striking distance of getting robust human rejuvenation, then it will be much less effective in accelerating subsequent funding and subsequent development of therapies. And that is something that we have to fix. Right, so that's what I've got to say. I, um, I, I, as, I, I, as promised, I've given far more questions than answers, and I'm certainly going to be interested in hearing what everyone else has to say on these topics. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll take a few questions now, and um, then we'll also have a panel session. Um, I'm, going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to take Chairman's privilege here and ask the question to Aubrey directly. And, and for the audio teams, we're giving uh, Mike Five back to Aubrey, and he's going to promise not to put it too close to his magnificent beard because it rustles. So keeping it separate. It doesn't rustle, so it's not that. See? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Five, turn up, please. I think it's working now. Yeah. No? It's on. It's definitely on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, shout out. What the hell? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Aubrey. <laughs> oh, Aubrey, the, the, your last slide says you know, one of the ways of getting stimulus for the general concept is to help people make money. Um, it strikes me that there's not much money in older mice. Are there other animals which we could lengthen the lifespan of first, which would actually be useful to people that would actually want to pay and would, you know, I don't know, silkworms or something like that, perhaps? I wish, I wish there were. I think it's really if I'm it. Um, uh, what the hell? Um, I wish there were. Of course, the, the most obvious examples that come up uh, when this is discussed, thanks, yeah. Right. Uh, the most obvious examples that come up when this is discussed are domestic pets, because there we don't just have the possibility of um, scientific breakthroughs, but also this can be solved in its own right. The unfortunate feature of this is that biology is so hard that biologists in pretty much every realm, whether it's gerontology or anything else, rely vastly on the work of other biologists that went before them. And that work translates across species very poorly in many cases. So it's going to be much harder to develop any of these technologies in species that have not got an enormous history of prior biological research than it is in ones that have. The fact that the, 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 fact that the main organisms studied in biology are mice and fruit flies, same as it was 50 or 80 years ago, is precisely for that reason. And of, sure, I would love to find better, better models. Certainly, I'd love to be able to get cats and dogs to live longer as quickly as we could get mice to live longer. But for purely biological reasons, that's not going to happen. OK. Question there, and then there's a few at the back. And sorry, there's a lot of questions here. Um, we'll take a few now, and then hopefully we can address a few more on the panel in a bit. Hi, Aubrey, it's Alex. Thanks for your talk. Okay, so my question is, you have, you say you had trouble getting traction in the East a lot. So um, I'm thinking, you know, Japan, here's a country with a massive demographic crisis. It's getting really old. They don't have the kids, and it's, it's, it's a really big problem for it. That they know it, and there's no really way through this. And now you're offering them a lifeboat off this sinking ship. Surely you should focus down maybe here and see what you can do. You would certainly think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. And arguably, China has an even bigger problem in the sense that their um, average age is, rising, is still rising really rapidly because they're obviously uh, at an earlier stage in the demographic transition. Uh, but the fact is, for both of those countries, just as for you know, Malaysia, Singapore, the, the Arab world, they just don't hear it. You know, I've been saying this, sure, and I do occasionally, as I mentioned, get, get uh, lecture invitations and interviews, just very occasionally. It's just like talking to a brick wall. They just can't see the possibility that ageing could be viewed as a medical problem. And I don't know how to change that. I just... As far as I can tell, it's probably just the same problem that it always was in the West. You know, one gets through eventually just by repeat advertising, but I'm at a much, uh, we're at a much earlier stage in that process at the moment. 
gentleman at the back. The yeah, uh, and Didier Garnel from uh, Heels, Healthy Life Extension Society. Uh, thank you for this very interesting uh, speech. I have many questions, but I, have, I will ask only one. <laughs> no. Uh, so we all know that uh, the people are dying of old age with uh, three big categories, uh, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and neurodegenerative uh, diseases. And for the last category, that's really the, uh, the place where we are not progressing a lot. And also, that's, the, that's probably the category of diseases where there is the la a larger consensus to make progress, a, a larger consensus in the public opinion, I mean. So uh, why don't you speak uh, more about the fact that we should really uh, invest more against Alzheimer's disease and the other neurodegenerative diseases because I think, once again, it's there that you have a larger consensus, so it's there that you can obtain more money, mm. and all, it's also there that you have uh, more problems of, because we are not progressing there. Yeah, good question. Well, I guess the main answer to your question, why I don't spend a lot of time speaking about that, is because it's not something, it, 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 the answer is embedded in your question. It's something that's already understood. Everyone appreciates, everyone who has deep pockets appreciates that the neurodegenerative diseases, especially Alzheimer's, are the single thing that the elderly are the most afraid of getting. Uh, not least because they're not very good at killing people, those diseases. So people tend to have them for quite a long time if they don't die of something else in the meantime. So this is not, this is not, um, a controversial question. The question is, given that we know that these diseases are extremely bad things, how do we go about addressing them? And unfortunately, just as for the other diseases of old age, the overwhelming presumption, not just among the scientific community, but among the general public and policy makers and opinion formers, is that these are diseases, like infections or like congenital diseases, things that can be addressed in principle by attacking their symptoms. Whereas, in fact, that should not be the way that they are viewed at all. The diseases of old age in general, certainly including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on, need to be viewed as part and parcel of aging and as completely different from from diseases that can be attacked at the level of symptoms. That fundamental understanding is that the identical same argument for neurodegenerative diseases as it is for everything else to do with aging, and unfortunately it's just as hard a sell as it is across other diseases. I, I'm going to ask if we can take three or four comments and then uh, Aubrey to come back on some synthesis of those. Uh, this gentleman there who's got the microphone and then to Rohit and there's two people, David, to your right. Yeah, and no, I'm with David Levy on this. I hate doing it that way. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm right, I've been over, over, overridden here, uh, right? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give quick answers there. Right, there you are. That's even better. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, with regard to the mouse uh, rejuvenation, uh, it seems to be on the news for quite a while, 2010 Harvard, for example. Uh, why are we still so uh, behind that, that plan? Is funding or different strategy? Yeah, that tells you how much of the news you can believe, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, the fact is, at the moment, we are making extraordinarily little progress in terms of what we see that's possible already. The amount of additional longevity that you can get for a mouse or a rat uh, of course, it's a function of how soon you start the therapy. You can do more if you start earlier. But for a given age of initiation of the therapy, the amount that we can get today is hardly any greater than what we could get literally 80 years ago in the 1930s. It's that bad. We've made basically no progress. And I believe that the reason we've ba made basically no progress is because we've been tackling it in the wrong way. Uh, hi, Aubrey. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, uh, I, uh, last September, Google announced an initiative to um, combat aging and age-related diseases, uh, and uh, they <coughs> seem to have a lot of capital, but not a plan, while you seem to have a plan, but not a lot of capital. Um, and uh, humans have a tendency to rationalize decisions after they made it, so uh, I'm afraid that they m it's possible that they might go for some um, not that effective life extension uh, techniques like you know uh, mimicking genetic effects of calorie restriction. So I wonder uh, how is the communication between you and uh, Calico's decision maker uh, and um, uh, how big do you think the opportunity cost of not 
getting true to them is. Uh, thanks. I, I assure you we are doing our absolute utmost to maximise our influence with Calico. At the moment, our influence is very limited. Uh, I've only met Art Levinson once. Uh, I'm f I, I, I feel reasonably confident that he won't put all his eggs in the wrong basket, largely because I feel reasonably com that confident that he won't put all his, eggs, all his eggs in any one basket. I think that with the kind of budget that's available to Calico, there is the option to adopt many different approaches. So far, I think the news is overall fairly good. Not as good as it would be if they were just listening to us all the time, but, um, but still, you know, they are starting out with the people who are making decisions not being car carrying gerontologists, in other words, not being people who think they already know the answer. Uh, and they're very smart people, you know, Art Levinson and David, uh, uh, and, um, you know, Baltimore, they, uh, they've got to have a CSO, are very, very um, smart. And the, so far, the only car carrying gerontologist they've brought in, Cynthia Kenyon, you know, her approach to doing all of this is different from mine, for sure, but she is ultimately one of the one of my heroes in the sense because because of her position on advocacy, even way back in the early 1990s when she became prominent uh, and when it was far more unfashionable to talk about doing anything about aging than it is now, she was out there you know fearlessly saying these things and putting her own you know faculty position at risk really and so on. So I think we're, they're ticking most of the boxes. I have reasonably high hopes, but we are doing our very best to improve the situation in regard to communication with Calico. Next question. <coughs> oh, really high. Um, what's interesting is when you sit down with politicians, sort of behind closed doors over a drink, uh, they become quite honest about this, and they say three things. One is that actually, if, if society ages dramatically, you push up the, the average voting age, and it leads to society becoming more conservative rather than less. Secondly, um, they're worried that already automation, etc., is increasing the unemployment rate, and having people live longer adds to that. And the third is they know the pension system can't cope. So actually what they tend to admit in private is what they'd really like is the day after you retire, you pop it. Uh, and and you know, they're being really honest now. They're saying we cannot afford to have old people. So how do you raise the discussion about this with them and corporate leaders who are also saying, by the way, our pension fund can't cope? How do you get them to embrace this conversation? Yeah, absolutely right. Very hard challenge this is. The only way to do it is to talk about a bigger sea change than that. Of course, the fears that you're describing only add up if one makes the assumption that change will be incremental, that we will have a continuing increase of longevity, but without the increase of youthfulness that may um, improve the, um, the ability and the willingness of the elderly to embrace novelty, for example. Similarly, in terms of retirement, we have to presume that there will be a continued decline in health that will justify us continuing to pay people uh, to do nothing after the age of 65, or even if it's up to 68 or 70 you know, still, um, it only makes sense if people are getting sicker, right? Um, uh, uh, so all of these things can only be answered if one says, no, listen, dummy, we're talking about genuinely not having aging anymore, about people being biologically 30 or so indefinitely, and therefore this problem does completely go away, all these problems go away, by virtue of the fact that the whole economic, well, the whole social contract I is redefined. Um. Oh, actually, I want to make a further point on that. I just got to finish, say one quick thing. The key thing is, people, politicians don't like to hear that either. But when you make them, when you, when you point out that rapid change is what we're talking about, then they begin to like it because the best analogy is with the credit crunch. You know, in 2008, governments got away with spending quantities of taxpayers' money that most people didn't even know existed. Right? Just because everyone knew there was this crisis and they just sort of realized we weren't in Kansas anymore. It's when change is really slow and incremental that the balance of vested interests lies with the status quo. Um, pardon my ignorance, I just want to know what it is about the process that makes it so expensive. <laughs> about what, biology in general? Well, just the, the particular field that you're, you're looking into. Yeah, what we're doing is not particularly expensive compared to most biology, partly because it's early stage. We're not doing any clinical trials or anything. Uh, you know, uh, nothing that we're doing is, is, is more expensive than similar work done towards the development of any drug. So, you, what, what figure do you actually need to do your work? We would... We would 
probably end up running out of really good ideas of what to spend money on if we were up in the range of 50 to 100 million dollars a year. And we've got about five at the moment. You're so right. Aubrey, uh, referring, referring to the gentleman's earlier comment uh, about uh, targeting, say, the Japanese or other uh, Eastern non-traditional cultures, or non-Western cultures, rather, what if you were interpreting, instead of uh, from, a non -sec from a secular perspective, if you were to take it into a religious perspective and tie in the ob objectives of longevity through the Bible, Gajas, Quran, and whatever, uh, we could actually possibly have the first objective benefit of institutionalized religion for the first time in human civilization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, this has not escaped me. Um, it's, it sounds good. First of all, when you're starting from actual scripture, you've got, you know, people can't be so, uh, be, be, people can't wriggle quite so much and, you know, maintain quite so clearly illogical positions. Um, but also, uh, of course, yeah, I mean, one can make a straightforward case that it would be a sin not to work on this because ultimately by not working on it, you're hastening people's death and you're also by working on it and getting this to work, you're alleviating a enormous amount of suffering. So it's pretty clear. Um, one has to, of course, make the case that the moral, that morally action and inaction are equivalent, but that's easy. You could talk about things like the parable of the Good Samaritan and so on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this, is, this should be straight forward. Unfortunately, though, at, at the end of the day, you come up against the hard will of people's traditionalism, and people who are religious tend to not want to think about radical changes to the way the world works. They tend to say, oh, it's natural, you know, God made it this way, and so on. Aubrey, thank you very much indeed.